Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa The human organism is analyzed in the, uh, the Buddha suttas as being um, described in terms of five aggregates, khandas. And these are um, the body, feelings, perceptions, consciousness, and mental formations. And this afternoon I'm going to speak a bit about the feelings aggregate, uh, Vedana. This is an essential, inescapable part of mental life. The category of Vedana is classed as a universal in the Abhidhamma, meaning that in each full moment of cognition, there occurs Vedana. So it's, uh, it's happening all the time, and it is not only in this human realm, but in every realm of existence, there, there's Vedana. It's this part and parcel of uh, having a, a mental, a conscious mental continuum. And it's a very important part of the process of, of consciousness, of knowing. And in a sense, you could say that it completes, it, it brings to culmination any act of knowing. It's like the final occurrence in the process brings it all together, and the, the act of cognition is felt. It's compared in one simile to the king taking his meal. The various cooks that work on the meal, they might taste the meal to make sure that it has the right balance of spices, but it's only the king that gets to sit down and enjoy the full meal. And the various cooks are like the various other mental processes. And the king is the, the one who experiences it at the end. When we make an act of cognition, first of all, there's a sense impression. Then there's a, a perception. And then the occurrence is classified as felt by the mind as being either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And this is what uh, Vedana is. We translate it as feeling, which is reasonable enough translation, but we have to be a little bit cautious. It's, it's more precise than the English word feelings, which is often used as a kind of equivalent of emotion, which is much broader and more complex. It's kind of... Uh, significant, interesting detail that there is no category word for emotion in, in the Pali. I first became aware of this when I was in California attending, together with some of the other monks from our tradition, I was attending talks given by the Dalai Lama, and he was talking in Tibetan, and somebody was translating for him, and in one section of the talk, he kept using the English word emotion in the middle of, he'd be speaking Tibetan and just push it into the middle of the sentence, uh, emotion. And we were discussing it after, and there was one woman there who was ordained as a Tibetan nun, and she knew Tibetan language. And we asked her, is there not a word for emotion in Tibetan? And she thought about it and says, I don't think there is. And then we tried to think, does anybody know a word in Pali for emotion? And there doesn't seem to be one, a category word. And uh, Ajahn Pasano said that he, he didn't think there was a good one in Thai either. So this category of emotion is something they did in, in the ancient Indian psychology, which is quite sophisticated. If you read Abhidhamma or study some of the more um, psychologically oriented suttas in the Samyutta, for example, you see it was quite a sophisticated system, but they didn't uh, didn't allow this category of emotion. It was just uh, individual emotions all have their place. They're all named, you know, uh, uh, love, envy, hate, 
Uh, all these have names, but there's no category word. So Vedana is a component, I would say, of what we call emotions. It underlies them, but it's it's much simpler. It's a very uh, immediate response of feeling either pleasure, pain, or neutrality. And this is the simple, basic way of categorizing the the feelings: is pleasant, sukha vedana unpleasant dukkha vedana and neutral adukamasukam or opeka and also we could say that the feelings are not um, they're not simply uh, categorized uh, in this kind of unitary way that you could say they, they exist on a spectrum that there are on the pleasant side, there are mildly pleasant feeling that's, you know, just the side of neutrality, just sort of feeling a bit at ease, content, and all the way up to ecstatic bliss. And on the negative side, there's this mild irritation all the way to extreme agony. And these occur at the end, as I say, at the end of each act of cognition. There will be a moment of, of Vedana feeling According to the Abhidhamma, feeling occurs either based on the mind sense or on the body sense. So the classification can then be a bit more complicated into saying pleasant or unpleasant bodily or mental. They use the words domanasa and somanasa for unpleasant and pleasant mental feeling. And dukkha and sukha are in Abhidhamma are unpleasant and pleasant uh, bodily feeling. The other senses, sight, hearing, taste, and smell, are said to be not strong enough to cause the arising of a feeling directly. That's mediated by the mind, the mind sense. The analogy is given, it's like putting a, a ball of cotton batten on a on an iron anvil. And if you strike it with another piece of cotton batten, then the anvil is not affected. But if you strike it with a hammer, then the, the anvil rings. And that's like the, the bodily sense and the mental sense are like the hammer. They're the only ones that have enough impact to cause a feeling to arise. So the implications of this are kind of interesting that nothing that we see or hear, smell or taste is intrinsically pleasant or unpleasant. It's mediated by our, by the mind sense. So we do have a saying in colloquial English, we say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, that no object is intrinsically in its nature beautiful or ugly, it's the viewer that makes that determination. It's the mind that likes this type of pleasing shape and dislikes another type. Same with tastes. We know that taste for different flavors varies with individuals, and within individuals it varies with time. It's quite common that, um, you know, there is actually another saying, acquired taste, something's an acquired taste, and it's quite common for young children have a, a liking only for sweet things, and then as they get older, they begin to appreciate you know, sour tastes and bitter tastes and, and more subtle flavors. The bodily sense, the sense of touch, is strong enough to have directly the experience of pleasure and pain, that contact with the body can be either pleasurable or painful immediately. It doesn't have to be mediated by the mind sense. It's not a matter of personal taste or preference that, you know, if you get poked in the eye with a sharp stick, it hurts. You know, that's just a immediate sensation, you know. The mind sense is the 
generator of uh, all the other feelings that aren't immediately felt by the sense of touch. So all the other external inputs mediated through the mind sense, as well as ideas, memories, concepts, fantasies that are produced entirely within the mind. And these mental objects can cause feeling tone as well. They can make us feel sad or, or happy. Yeah. We can feel pleasant or unpleasant feeling entirely on imaginary objects like a memory or um, a daydream or an anxiety. Uh, now awareness of the, the feelings, knowing the feelings is a crucial aspect of mindfulness practice, being aware of the feelings. It's one of the four satipatthana, one of the four foundations of mindfulness is awareness directed towards the feelings because they are so central to our existence that if we're not fully aware of them, then we end up being under their sway and leads us astray in different ways. If the pleasurable sense, the feeling of pleasure is not clearly seen and understood, that leads to craving, desire. If the unpleasant feelings are not clearly seen, then that leads to aversion, ill will. And if the neutral feelings are not clearly seen, that, that leads to ignorance, dullness. One way in which this works itself out is described in the dependent origination. The um, description of the specific stages of cause and effect that cause this experience of existence that we we know and one section of the series begins with the moment of contact because we have sense organs we have contact meaning that the mind contacts the sight the sound etc and contact is the three things come together, the sense organ, the consciousness, and the object. Then there's a moment of contact, pasa. And with each moment of contact, there follows inevitably as a resultant, meaning that you don't have any input into it, no direct control of it, there follows a feeling. And depending on the contact, and uh, that will be pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. It's important to understand that at that stage, that's resultant, meaning that it's, it's an automatic process that's running down from causes and conditions, and you don't really have any say in it. So the feeling is like something given. Yeah? But then the next moment is when the series changes gear and becomes volitional, meaning that we have the possibility of changing direction. If we don't make an effort, if we follow the path of least resistance, it'll just follow down the uh, time-worn track of contact to feeling to the next one, which is tanha, craving. A craving inevitably arises after uh, a moment of feeling unless we're extremely mindful and make an effort to not go there. This is spoken about by some of the uh, meditation masters. Ajahn Buddhadasa, in his um, books that he's written on dependent origination and meditation, he makes this a, so one of his major teaching points, is that this, this moment between Feeling and craving is the critical moment when you can break the dependent origination. You can not continue the going around the loop. You can have a, a little moment of freedom. And it requires, uh, first of all, being fully, clearly aware of the feeling. So mindfulness directed towards the feelings. You see the 
see the feeling in the moment. And it doesn't matter whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. They're all equally valid as objects at this point. You just see this. This is a sensation. This is a feeling. And be aware of it. But the mind that's just following the easy path of least resistance will naturally go into craving tanha. It wants pleasant feeling or it wants to escape unpleasant feeling. And the neutral feeling is perceived as boredom. The mind wants some, you know, some excitement, some stimulation. But in any case, there's a moment of, of craving. And if you analyze craving, I think you can see that at least for the type of craving we call kamha tanha, the sense desire craving, what is actually desired is always pleasant feeling. We desire many different things. Right? You can make a list of what you know what you want for Christmas. You know, the, the, the the human being has a multitude of different desires, but if you take any desire that you might have and analyze it, why do I want this thing? In the end, it'll come down to because I think or I know from having it previously experienced it that it will give me some happiness happy feeling. So what we actually want is happy feeling. That's what craving is basically after. And everything else is a means to that end. It's something that will serve that purpose of yielding up happy feeling. But if we see happy feeling just as it is, just as a feeling, and don't allow it to become craving, then we don't have to go there. And then if we allow craving to arise, then the rest of the dependent origination follows. There's upadana, clinging, which is craving matured into a into a, a system or a project. And this is then leads to bhava, becoming. And this sequence is when a self is created. The craving itself is pretty rudimentary. It's just a, a an impulse of the mind towards an object. But when you get to upadana and bhava, you're creating a self because now there's a relationship set up between the self and the other. If you crave something strongly enough that it turns into clinging and becoming, then there's a relationship set up between the possessed and the possessor. So there's a self and other uh, and you're caught then at that point you're going into birth old age and death so the key moment the weak link in the chain is between feeling and, and craving so the objective is to be clearly aware of the feelings if we practice this as a methodical effort in in the, in the meditation if we're aware of the feelings as we should be trying to be aware of all the objects of consciousness including the feelings then the mind goes through various stages culminating in what is called equanimity about formations which is critical stage in vipassana it's not enlightenment but we could say it's the the, the jumping off place it's the uh, the base camp you know, it's the only place from which liberation and awakening can occur yeah. and it's also as far as effort can take you and it's equanimity about formations because the feelings have settled down by not giving into craving by just calmly observing the feelings the feelings tend to oscillate less you know that they it settles down to neutrality mm-hmm. neutral feeling and this is opaque or neutral feeling and this is important aspect of, of understanding feeling is understanding neutral feeling the upeka. 
as this is something that's easily missed because it doesn't grab the attention like pleasure and pain just being equanimous being neutral neutral feeling arises all the time a lot of our experience is just just that it's just neutral it isn't doesn't cause us either pleasure or pain it's just a a neutral middling kind of a feeling there is some debate within buddhism within the theory of of um, the psychological theory about feelings whether in ordinary experience there's really such a thing as purely neutral feeling or whether this all feeling is a little bit on one side or the other i think in practical terms it's probably more like the feelings are on a spectrum so there's a broad range of pleasant and unpleasant and there's a zone in the middle we could call neutral that might be you know slightly pleasant or slightly unpleasant but i think there's also a lot of just purely neutral just doesn't cause a strong reaction one way or the other but there's still a feeling that's still a feeling it's not an absence of feeling there's still a, a just a sense of of presence of uh uh this is here this is what is this equanimous sense and if it's not clearly seen because the mind perceives it as as not exciting as boring as dull you know this is uh what leads to ignorance and dullness not be aware and missing the subtle objects because we're looking for excitement right? so uh, if the mind is really clear and sharp and awake then it does tend more and more towards this neutrality and there is that lovely pali word tatra majjhata that expresses the type of neutral feeling that's fully awake that's aware that's uh, activated with um with the mind very mindful neutrality is being in the middle about that majja tata is like majja is middle tata is like a makes a noun out of a verb or an adjective and tatra is a form of um like there that this one so it's a specific neutrality so whatever arises to the mind is seen with neutrality it's not just a general dulled out sense of being neutral but specific objects arise and one is neutral and with equanimity about formations the mind has that very stable neutral feeling tone about everything everything which arises so even things in the ordinary mind would cause excitement or terror or ecstatic bliss they're just seen with neutrality by the mind in equanimity about formations the mind you know can take anything it's very stable that which arises is just seen as an object and it's a very peaceful state of mind so it's pleasant in the sense of peacefulness stillness but not pleasant in the sense of happiness or bliss and this state of mind allows a disengagement with samsara because it's no longer gripping this mechanism of feelings leading to craving is not operating very strongly at that point it's very weak and loose so the mind can break free of it altogether it's also in the uh, sequence of mind states associated with the jhanas the feeling tone of equanimity is reserved for fourth jhana that the mind goes through first second third jhana associated with states of happiness of pleasant uh, pleasant vedana uh, the lower form is pitti which is uh, translated as rapture usually it, it's a kind of thrilling happiness and the higher form is sukha which is a peaceful oceanic happiness but then that's 
overcome uh, or transcended by Upeka in fourth jhana. So in the jhana path as well, they have this progression through happiness towards uh, Upeka, towards uh, neutrality. Another way of looking at the feelings is in terms of ethical considerations, ethical states. And in the Abhidhamma classifies different types of consciousness in different ways. And one of the divisions is between kusala and akusala, skillful and unskillful, which are those which lead to pleasant karma and those which lead to unpleasant karma. These terms are used instead of good and evil. You know, it's, a, it's a much more descriptive way of speaking. It's not so value laden. You know, it just talks about what skillful, skillful states of mind and unskillful states of mind. And then it lists, you know, what type of mental associates arise with different types of consciousness. An unpleasant feeling only arises in unskillful mind states, which is quite interesting, has a lot of um, important uh, uh, implications. You could say basically it's never it's never spiritually positive to feel bad. Yeah. There's no no gain made you know, by feeling by feeling uh, unpleasant feelings. You have to be a bit careful with that. So I have encountered in the past, some people take it the kind of the, the wrong way and they they compound their suffering because they think, oh, I'm feeling bad, I must be a wicked person. <laughs> I feel even worse. <laughs> the reality is you're going to have unpleasant feelings until you're an arahant. You, know, you have to be realistic about it. But it is useful to understand and to help to help yourself not wallow in, in unpleasant mental states to, is, is to realize it's never skillful. And there's nothing to be gained by punishing yourself, making yourself miserable. No. Pleasant and neutral can both arise in either uh, skillful or unskillful states. And it's kind of an interesting thing too with some implications to ponder that uh, pleasant feeling acts in a way like an ethical intensifier. If you do an unskillful deed, you know, what we would call like a bad thing, you know, you hurt somebody or, or you know, cause some damage in the world to, and you take relish in it, you enjoy it, it's a worse karma than if you just do it cold-bloodedly, neutrally. And likewise, if you do a good deed, if you make a skillful act, an act of kindness or generosity, and you do it with joy in your heart, it's more comically powerful, it's better karma than if you just do it neutrally, it doesn't, doesn't move you to joy. No. So joy, a pleasant feeling, acts as a comic intensifier. No. So if you're going to do a, a good deed, a generous deed, try and enjoy it. Try and make it, you know, be happy about it, that, that gives you... While you'll enjoy it, you'll have some pleasant feeling immediately, and plus it's better karma. Yeah. You know, we could talk a little bit about dealing with unpleasant feeling in the body, the dealing with a pain, physical pain, and the difference of that to mental pain. This is something that is a very useful practical thing, and often for, for meditators, something that one hears often people complaining about pains in the body when they're trying to sit in meditation. But even just in general life, you know, with, with illness or injury or age, you know, the body gets aches and pains and is learning to deal with them. And to understand there's these two, two components. There's the physical dukkha, which comes directly from the body sense. But then there's the mental domanasa. Right? The first one is pretty much uh, inescapable. It's just it's given. There's you know there's a pain in the body, and there may or may not be anything you can do about it. 
but it's there, it's a reality, it's a sensed experience, and it's unpleasant, it's classified as unpleasant. And there's probably a good evolutionary reason that we have pleasant and unpleasant sensations in, in the body. For an organism in, in, in a primitive state, in the wild, it uh, acts as a control to move them away from danger and towards things that are helpful for the survival and propagation of the species. They're, they act as a carrot and a stick, guiding behavior, pleasant and unpleasant. So they're deeply hardwired into us. But then there's the mental aspect, which is really, uh, may not always seem like it, but it is actually optional. You, know, you don't have to have the mental suffering. So you've got a pain in the body it's just a painful sensation, that's all it is. But then the mind adds to that by complaining, whinging, you know, giving this kind of, why me, why do I always have these aches and pains? And just that multiplies the suffering. And it's really entirely avoidable. The mind can uh, not go there, can disengage from that. And it helps to uh, have some sense of, of the emptiness, the not me, not mine, around the sensation. You know, if you've got a, a sore foot, you've stepped on something sharp and you've got a sore foot. If you're thinking all the time, oh, my foot hurts, it's going to be worse. But if you just notice this is painful sensation, then it's not, it's not as much suffering involved. The physical sensation is exactly the same, but there's not... The mental suffering is the cause of most of the, the, the suffering that we endure. And I was a little bit tentative at the beginning of this bit in saying the physical pain is more or less unavoidable because it is actually possible to use the mind to disengage from physical sensation. It, this is something the Buddha did in uh, the last year of his life when he had a lot of physical ailments and suffering. He would go into jhana states to escape from the physical sensation. And samadhi does that disengagement from the body. So if you have some, some degree of ability to meditate deeply, then uh, you, know, you can deal with physical suffering by retreating into a mental continuum that's not so much in touch with the body. Yeah. So these are really the two ways of dealing with physical pain that our practice offers. One is like an insight practice and one is a jhana practice or samadhi practice is either just being present with the sensation but not identifying with it and not, um, not allowing it to flourish into other mental states. You know, that's an insight development. And the other one is to disregard the sensation and retreat into deep focus on, on an object like the breath. And uh, sort of that way you can tune out the sensations. So you can see that in all these different ways that the feeling, aggregate of feeling is a very important part of our mental life. It's not to be in any way trivialized or disregarded, but it's also not to be put on a pedestal and made to be something important because it is essentially empty like all the other aggregates. There are... Uh, metaphors that the Buddha gave for the five aggregates to express the emptiness of them. The body is like sea foam. Uh, consciousness is like a conjuring trick. Perception is like a mirage in the desert. Mental formations are hollow like a plantain tree trunk. And feelings are said to be like bubbles. Bubbles are like soap bubbles you know, that um, they can be very big and colorful, 
but they're very ephemeral. They just come and go, and they can burst easily, and they just they're, they're, there's really nothing there. It's just a impressive looking, attention demanding structure, but there's no you know, no substance to it. So you have to see the the feelings as dependently arisen, as not me, not mine, and as empty. Not, not identify with them. See them in their own nature for what they are. Sadhu, 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 sadhu